you want to start experimenting to become familiar so you can make use of the tools as you go along. The most important thing is not to think VR only, but VR ready. So being able to run across all devices, the experience being, a, you know, have user having agency over the experience, being able to choose the outcomes, influencing the experience should work across all devices. And choosing a platform that does that, I think is the most important step. Welcome to the Learning Way Working Podcast. If this is the first Learning Way Working Podcast you've listened to, I'm Robin Pettit, the host of the podcast and founder of Sprout Lab. In this conversation, I'm talking with Denny Stefan. Denny's a pioneer of 3D technologies. He's founded a number of VR-related companies, including LearnBright, a 3D web-based learning experience platform. We talk about the barriers and possibilities of using augmented reality and VR for learning. And maybe more importantly, we talk about how some of the web-based VR systems can be used to solve some of these challenges. Hi, Danny. Welcome to the Learning While Working podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So the Apple Vision Pro has got people talk, talking again about uh, augmented reality. What do you think is the potential of um, augmented reality in workplace learning? Well, where to start? I mean, that's that's a huge topic. <clears throat> we've got so much to cover. The Apple Vision Pro actually is, is we've got we got a device very early. In fact, we with the platforms I've been working on, we managed to get our apps running on it even before it was released. So the device is incredible as far as quality, quality of visuals, the operating system, the designs, everything is, is really great. The price, however, is a little bit up there, but it is targeted at developers. So if the L&D is going to start exploring that, you know, it's really for proof of concept work rather than rolling out over an organization. I mean, at three and a half K per headset, you're not going to roll it out to everyone and shipping headsets around in an organization is relatively expensive to do and logistically, it's, you know, it's a bit of trouble. So I think the application of using this type of technology for both fully immersive experiences and augmented reality experiences is absolutely terrific. There are a few other headsets on the market that are you know, better priced so you can start to explore and experiment. And I do think it's at the experimental stage still. To get a return on investment, you need to really get it into the organization and start utilizing it and figuring out what works. There's not a lot of stuff off the shelf that you buy that'll get you instant return on investment. Having said that, you know, building these experiences, if you can make them work across all devices, you get a, a much better return on investment. So if you build an experience that can be used with augmented reality in the headsets, which is a great experience, but also deploy it on tablets, phones, and other devices, then you're going to be able to use that experience across your whole workforce. And that way you can really justify and get that return you know, within the first year, absolutely. Okay, so you sort of certainly sit there and say this is a 3D space we're building. If it's portable across the different types of playback devices, it gives you just so much more flexibility. It's reminding me of a project I helped mentor someone through at one stage, and there was actually a video-based VR scenario with dealing with a difficult customer. And the organization has actually got a little bit messed up with what the definition of VR was because they'd done a whole series of panoramic photographs and presented those as VR. So when she was talking about these other things that were more complicated that needed headsets and things, people didn't quite get why the cost increased tenfold in, in its own self as well. Yeah, it, look, terminology gets messed up in, in the whole industry. It's very messy out there and it's hard to get clarity and that's why you, know, you should align or listen to people that are experts in the industry and can set things straight because there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of you know people that jump on the bandwagon. Uh, the amount of uh, hype around the Apple Vision Pro is incredible. Uh, a lot of people almost like their first time discovering virtual reality, even though it's been around for quite some time. They're just suddenly discovering it and uh, overnight excess technology when they really don't have the the fundamentals and the way to describe it to organizations. So uh, you get a lot of noise. So do listen to the, you know, the people in the market that know what they're talking about and you'll get, listen to many opinions. Hopefully the, the good ones will bubble to the top. I even played on that bit of hype, by the way, deliberately, Danny, by starting with actually that as a question. Because I just think it's always interesting to see how people actually pick things up because 
different companies back things at certain stages. So what do you think is maybe the three big, big application areas learning should look for in the augmented reality area? Yeah, so in augmented reality, I mean, the, the top the most obvious one is in a context where you need hands-free operation, right? So learning on the job, learning in facilities, in factories, even you know, traditional onboarding of finding your way around a, a location. These things are great because if you've got your hands free and you can look at, let's say, standard operating procedures on machinery or you know, installation or repairs, those type of things, and you can augment with extra information while you're doing those things, that's really great. You know, it's not new. Uh, we've been doing this with uh, Microsoft HoloLens uh, since their first version as well. They have a guides application that does that. And there's been equally many experiences similarly run on tablets and phones by, by a few really great software providers. So the, the concept of doing that is pretty recognized. And I think the Apple Vision Pro uh, you know, gives a quality of visuals, which is, is great. It's a little bit heavy as a headset, so you know you might want to try lighter weight options and cheaper options like the MetaQuest Three, for example. And you know, hopefully, we get to a con convergence where devices like the Apple Vision Pro and uh, AR glasses that are see-through, like Magic Leap, uh, which actually lets you see the real world instead of filming it on a camera and then projecting it to your eyes. Those type of experiences, Magic Leap and Hololens, are, are in my mind where we want to be when doing augmented reality. You know, it's just a, it's a, a nicer experience. You've got your full peripheral vision and everything available as well, which is just in a, a workplace environment, especially in industry, uh, I think is also important from a safety perspective. So yeah, that's, that's one application for using AR. Uh, you mentioned one exactly uh, just before about you know, dealing with uh, objections or difficult customers. I think th the recent explosion in AI capabilities has allowed us to build virtual people uh, that you can now have interactions with that feel really satisfying. So you can sit uh, you know, across the table from someone who's either being a difficult customer or raising objections or anything you can imagine. These soft skills can really be experienced and practiced in a safe environment. And uh, you can learn from that really quickly and easily, but the, the, the immersive nature of it makes it stick more. I mean, the, the real truth is that 80% you know, of the improvement on learning is actually learning by doing, being in the experience and having agency and being able to drive the experience, change the outcomes by your actions. I think that's the most vital part of what this technology is driving. Whether that's on a flat screen or in VR, you know, I think 80% of it is the, the user-directed experience. The immersion adds the extra you know, 20% and puts you in that environment with zero distractions, We're really focused on this, this goal of the, the immersion, the experience that you're in. Once you're engaged in a natural experience where you're talking to a character, they're talking back to you, they're gesturing, changing their facial expressions, you, know, you start to believe that you're in that experience and you start to act as you naturally would. And you, you start to learn in character rather than generally what you do you know, with traditional learning is watching a video, going through a slideshow, reading a PDF. And it's all very abstract, right? You're just, you're, you're learning it on a, you know, abstract level and then trying to apply it or imagine it in your mind. Uh, but with, with the immersive technologies and being there and being co-present with uh, artificial characters just gives you a whole immediate comprehension that becomes part of your, you know, your nature and your character. So I think that's a, a huge shift that organizations undervalue. They really don't know yet you know, what they're missing out on if they haven't invested in these type of training activities. It's sort of one of those things that you wouldn't expect to put on a headset and watch some slides with a voiceover. So it means that the learning design, it has to shift to that whole experiential thing. It has to be based on a simulation and it becomes very natural to do that. And that's one of the things I get excited about with it, that, that you can't keep on reusing knowledge-based approaches to learning. You actually have to build experiences for people to be part of and to help them transform. Actually, interesting enough, Danny, with the work that you do with organisations, do you also design the, the prep and the debrief for people after experiences? Generally not. Generally, we'll take the existing materials an organisation has. So, for example, in our platform, we can import and use existing video and even courses from an LMS. 
and they can exist within the 3D environment. So they might contain the abstract knowledge, you know, the things that you need to just read and learn. And then the learning by doing experience reinforces what you might have consumed there. What this does is actually makes a very easy on-ramp for organizations to leverage their existing content in an immersive experience. True, it's 2D content and still might be a little bit laborious to get through, but putting it in a 3D context, wrapping a little bit of gamification around it, maybe having some AI bots that quiz you on the stuff that you've learned, just connects it into that whole experience. So the idea is to have micro engagements all along the journey. So people, even if they're looking around in different directions, that's a micro engagement that you don't get when you're just looking straight at a slideshow. The, the only mi micro engagements you get with a slideshow is clicking the next button, right? I call that lean back learning, where you're basically sitting back and just clicking next, 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 or watching a video. But what you want is what I call lean forward learning. So you're, you're engaged and you're leaning forward a bit and you're, you're just making these interactions and all of that adds to the retention, the experience it means you can complete the training a lot faster too when people are engaged. But the ultimate part of it is that that weaving into your character and your experience and the retention that goes with that. So yeah, I think you can reuse a lot of assets. You can get going very, very quickly and even creating AI characters nowadays. Uh, if you've, you've gone through the sort of prompt training in L&D, that's something we do. We take L&D experts through how to build prompts that can be effective you can actually keep these characters, AI characters on topic, and they can not only kind of conjure things into the 3D environment when they want to, but they can assess your performance as well, at least good enough to do gap analysis to see who's performing well or not. And each playthrough is going to be different and unique, but still on topic. And that for, you know, refresher learning or nudging people along a journey, you know, across 12 months is just an amazing value that's been added to the learning and development base of tools that are available. So it's a pretty exciting time. Uh, I think L&D is, is you know, reinventing itself right now. This year, interesting. I've been thinking about doing another virtual conference, Danny, and I keep on having this sort of vague title for it called Shifts because it's actually the first time in the last 12 months where I feel like people have actually started to shift their conversation. And it is partly because of the AI and tech has just become so much more mainstream and accessible to everyone. And it's, yeah, it's interesting. I haven't felt that shift for a long time, which is probably the best way to put it. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's driven by, you know, C-level executives seeing the value in AI, knowing that they don't want to be left behind. And traditionally, L&D have been overwhelmed with the amount of work they need to do and with minimal budgets. So they always get stuck in, we can just produce a, you know, a slideshow. But now there's investment in using these new tools because the value is understood, or at least people know they don't want to be missing out. So that opens up the discussion with L&D to start exploring how they can deliver better training and unlocks better budgets to do so. And I think that's really important in L&D. So you've talked a little bit about some of the some of the barriers, like the cost of the Apple Vision Pro. What would you say are those really big three barriers to adoption of these types of technologies in L and D? And after this, I'm going to then ask you how can those barriers be removed as well, Danny? Well, I actually wrote a great article on this that has 13 reasons why not to use VR, <laughs> which is kind of crazy because I'm one of the biggest advocates of virtual reality for nearly three decades. So, you know, it, it sounds a bit not the right thing to be saying, but it actually, there are real reasons that VR only is, is not the correct solution. So, you know, the top ones are obviously rolling out headsets, the hardware that you need to deploy across an organization, give it to everyone. You've got a choice of Either you buy enough headsets for everyone and the, the devices become outdated, that's, that's an issue, and they cost them. And you've got, leg if you want to just send them out to people like Accenture did, you know, people that joined Accenture get sent a headset to do their onboarding experience in an immersive VR world, then you know, you've got to send headsets out, get them sent back. The logistics are a bit of a nightmare. And the locking the applications into things that you build as apps and then deploy. So if anyone works in large organizations, education, government, they know that rolling out new software or technology is an absolute nightmare from IT security and the support side of things. Headsets have apps as well, but the headsets don't have centralized management solutions or they're not compatible with the general ones like Microsoft Intune, which you can manage all of your devices with. So there's custom solutions for device management and deploying apps. So that, that's a, a big frustration. There's also getting the return on investment. If you've got 100 headsets, but you've got 60,000 staff, how are you going to get that return on investment that 
justifies spending on building the training. So you know, those are some of the big ones. And some people can't wear headsets. They, they just don't. The, the battery life is an hour, right? So you, 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 you only have that much capacity unless you plug in. Some people don't want to wear them. I remember this is way back in the 90s. I was at a trade show in Melbourne, Australia, and we were getting people to come up to an expo stand to put a virtual reality headset on. And I remember a lady came up and she said, I really want to try it, but I can't put that on. I said, why not? She said, it's going to mess up my hair. And that was a reasonable response, right? You know, if you've got makeup on or you just had your hair styled, you're not going to put this device on and, and ruin your look for the day just because you, you wanted this one experience. These are all small but justifiable reasons. Uh, there are ways around solving a lot of this, though. And sadly, Apple hasn't fully committed to this, but other all the other manufacturers have, which is support for delivering these experiences not as apps but as web experiences. So you can actually go in and deploy, just like you would a web page, an immersive experience. You know, Apple's gone part of the way there with their headset. So the Safari browser comes in the Apple Vision Pro and it supports the WebXR standard uh, that allows you to go to a web page, 3D web page, and it becomes immersive and wraps around you fully. Unfortunately, they've put it behind special browser flags that you have to turn on on each device. And you know, that's really restrictive and they don't support the ability to see through in augmented reality mode, only immersive VR. So they've kind of chopped it off at the knees for now. Hopefully they open it up more, but it's a little bit sad to see that those restrictions in place. Uh, but you know, I don't know whether it's intentional because the technology is not ready or you know, they're trying to push more people to apps. But it is, it is still great that they they're actually have support for that. So if you're using web technology, you can roll stuff out across the whole organization across the world without having to send any apps out, get IT involved. But also if you use the right platform and technology, the, as I mentioned before, the application, that 3D experience can be experienced on every device from mobile, tablet, laptops, Chromebooks, desktops, and immersive VR. And that's when an organization can get a real return on investment. As I mentioned, you know, 80% of the the value of these experiences is you driving the journey and the, it reacting to what you do. So if you can do that on flat screen devices as well, yeah, sure, maybe a few hundred, maybe a thousand people in the organization try it with the headsets and the other 60,000 do it on their desktops or laptops through their LMS or just following a link. Suddenly you get a return on investment and it makes it worthwhile and you can start to build on that success to deploy more and more immersive experiences, but not exclude anyone in the, these days of diversity, you know, equity, inclusion, accessibility. It's really important that the, that experience should be available across a myriad of devices for all audiences within an organization. A lot in what you just said there, Danny. Thank you. As you're talking, one of the things I realised I haven't actually tried it via headset since I've got my special new head feature, which it keeps on moving. I don't think it's going to be a comfortable experience to have the world keeping on moving, as the, as possibly with a little bit of a lag as my head keeps on moving. So it's a it's an interesting one, that particular one, the actual uncomfortableness of a headset. And it's actually one reason why I think the augmented reality may be a little bit different because you're not completely shut off. Yeah, well, I noticed you're wearing spectacles. So, you know, I think we're headed to those spectacle-sized devices in the future. And that's where I think the pivot or the you know, tipping point happens. At the moment, we've got enthusiasts and people that are really excited about VR and this niche use cases that are being creating real value within organizations. But when it hits the consumer market and that tipping point where it says lightweight and easy to wear as sunglasses and becomes the Apple Vision Pro has already become a style statement in a lot, a lot of cases. But you know, when it, you know, I'd really like what uh, Meta did with Ray-Bans, for example, from a marketing perspective. Uh, we all hoped that they would be augmented reality glasses. They're not. But you know, eventually, we'll start to see that sort of device you know, come into the market. And there are a few other companies working on that. And I think we're getting closer and closer, step by step, to that pivot point where we won't be looking down at our phone anymore. We'll be using our spectacles as our user interface. I call it the race to the face <laughs> because whoever owns our eyeballs owns our attention. And, uh, you know, that's one of the, the most valuable um, channels in the world. And you know, this is going to be a, a tipping point in human history where we move from flat two-dimensional content consumption to three-dimensional content. And that media type becomes bigger than video, becomes bigger than you know, text or audio. And that's, that's unlocking 
and kind of coming full circle, right, back to pre-internet, you know, the world around you was the, the interface. And I think, you know, eventually a technology will wrap right around and will be 3D will be the main user interface that we work with. At least you contemplated a couple of times that it's a sort of thing that phone is really just like a piece of paper in our hands. It's, 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 it's sort of odd that it's evolved as that particular dom- almost our dominant thing, that it's not particularly physical within and connected to our bodies. So, yeah, it's just, and I think the spectacles examples are just a, a great example of that. I just also want to talk about something about the web tech because I think that's a lovely bit of wisdom, Danny, for, to talk to people about. Isn't one of the issues also with some of the web 3D experiences just the resolution, quite polygon-based? I agree. Like web, web technology for 3D is a little bit behind. So game engines like Unity and Unreal, when you deploy them as apps on devices, they maximize the quality and the, the experience that they can create on the devices because they really can dig right down into the APIs and use the most of the capabilities. With web, you know, there's a, a few little hindrances that have been slowing it down, but it's been increasing consistently. So you know, now we, we can have assembly in the browser and we can use web GPU. There's a lot of capabilities there. And it's only a matter of time now that the, the software tools catch up to the, the APIs that are now unlocked. So you know, as far as I'm concerned, in the browser, you have access to as much as you need to to do what these game engines do. But the big difference is there's so much more value to be unlocked. The game ecosystems are great for building games, but they're not ecosystems for building enterprise, education, government systems. And they don't don't have easy ways to connect or work within or around other existing web applications. So when you build a, a 3D engine, we actually spent the last 10 years building our own 3D web engine, so web stack from the ground up. And with that, we can leverage things like the, the CDN networks. We can leverage security, data security, and privacy models and technology that's been in place for years and being tested. Suddenly, we, we can integrate with 100 different enterprise systems and connect that value to an organization. Instead of it being a 3D experience that exists in a silo and standing alone and you know, off to the side, Suddenly, it ha- you can bring in SharePoint documents and Office documents. You can use Miro and Mural for, for brainstorming. You can use your single sign-on and get into your corporate network and you have content that never leaves that corporate boundary. All of these things that organizations have come to work with and, and the way that they operate, the policies they have, everything can align when you go web-based. And the game engines, you have to rebuild everything. One of my um, colleagues runs a VR tool for the learning space and they went the path of apps. They have to now manage and deploy 14 different applications and update and get them out on the app stores and get people to update them just to stay, to release one feature. Now web-based, you make the feature and it's suddenly available for anyone that reloads the web page. So you know, the difference is huge uh, and people don't understand that yet. And I think it's, it's just a matter of time till people start to understand the value. I can tell you, we, we built learning experiences even before the headsets came out, before the HoloLens came out, before the MetaQuest came out, before the, the Apple Vision Pro came out. We were able to send those links to the development teams and they were able to go in and test those experiences in those devices pre-launch. So we, you, know, you can create a future-proof solution Uh, by going web as well. And that just reduces the total cost of ownership and risk. And I think those things organizations really, really align with. When we deploy to large organizations, there's IT, security, privacy, procurement, everyone gets involved to make a committee of decisions as to whether this would be safe and valuable to roll out an organization and web ticks all the boxes. Mm, I think it's just got lots of things that are familiar around it compared to the um, app um, ecosystem as well. So what's your greatest piece of advice to an l and person who wants to start experimenting with, with this type of technology? Well, obviously, the first thing to say is start now. You, you want to start experimenting to become familiar so you can make use of the tools as you go along. I think the most important thing is not to think VR only but VR ready. So that, that what I've been mentioning about being able to run across all devices. So 
the experience being, you know, have the user having agency over the experience, made, being able to choose the outcomes, influencing the experience should work across all devices. And if choosing a platform that does that, I think is the most important step. And probably choosing a no-code platform. You don't need to code these things. There's enough tools out there now that you don't have to become a Unity programmer in order to make these things. For us, we, we built a tool that is targeted at instructional designers with their existing skills. If you know Articulate Storyline or Adobe Captivate, then you can jump in, start dragging and dropping content, creating an experience with your existing skills. Sure, there's a bit to learn, a new way of thinking, but that's better than having to become an expert programmer or a 3D designer or a 3D animator. So, so try, try a plethora of tools and start playing with them, but make sure when you're assessing them that they can work across all those different devices. And you'll be able to build you know, courses and SCORM packages that you can deploy into existing LMS and play them on the mobile phone, but also then jump in with a VR headset and try it in full immersion. Definitely buy a headset and start experimenting and seeing what it's like and showing your stakeholders in your organization what that can be like. I think that's going to get them aligned and get them excited about you pursuing that journey further. Cool. Thank you for the lovely wrap up. And that tool you're talking about for instructional designers is the um, Learn Bright tool, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, yeah, Learn Bright uh, is our, uh, that's B R I T E, Learn Bright, uh, is our tool for instructional designers to build uh, both scenarios with uh, environments, with AI and uh, environments you can interact with, but also for um, virtual meetings. So, virtual instructor led training in 3D immersive spaces, which is another great use case. So, being, being able to be together, co present in these environments and experiences is a whole other level, and it's a very exciting aspect. Cool. Thank you for a great conversation today, Danny. And I'll make sure there's a link to a couple of those platforms that you're responsible for and leading in the show notes as well. So thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Pleasure to talk to you. And I hope to do it again soon. Thank you for listening to the Learning While Working podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please leave a review. If you want to find out more about Sprout Labs, go to sproutlabs.com.au. We regularly run webinars and publish ebooks and guides about learning while working.